My name is Dave Watson. I'm the pastor of Calvary Chapel on Staten Island. I've had the privilege of pastoring there since 1990. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share in this panel, talking about our personal experiences on 9-11. To my immediate left is Pastor Paul Schooling. Pastor, serves, uh, pastor Schooling serves as the associate pastor of congregational care at Calvary Chapel. He has been serving our city in pastoral capacities for over 35 years. Uh, on 9-11 and shortly thereafter, he ministered in a, in a huge way uh, near ground zero to the first responders. Pastor Schooling is recovering or has recovered from 9-11 throat cancer, and we're grateful for his presence with us today. <laughs> Full disclosure, I have known Pastor Schooling for 30 years, and he is still my friend. Uh, still. <laughs> Next to him is uh, Reverend Rick, Ricky Del Rio. Full disclosure, Ricky and I have known each other now almost for an hour and 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> Pastor Del Rio has been serving our city since the 70s, uh, founding Abounding Grace Ministries in 1982, founding Abounding Grace Church in 1992. Um, he was one of the first clergy, if not the first clergy besides Michael Judd, uh, at Ground Zero. Uh, he is recovering, uh, or has recovered, God willing, we'll say that, from thyroid cancer, 9-11 thyroid cancer. So gentlemen, it's my privilege to talk to you about uh, some amazing times, some amazing times as we look back uh, 20 years. Uh, Rick, wh why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, where you were the first moments of 9-11. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having this and for allowing me to share my story. Um, I've been a pastor in the Lower East Side, and along with that, I've served the police and the community uh, in the midst of uh, different uh, situations. So I have a police, uh, a clergy liaison ID, and um, I've worked with the gangs and et cetera. Bottom line is the night before, I had company from Texas, and they came, uh, we stayed in a hotel uptown. I lived only two miles north of Ground Zero, and it's like the Lord just put me up there, keep me away, because usually I'm in the middle of the situations when they happen. And um, so I was uptown when the first tower hit, had no idea, was sitting up having breakfast, somebody runs in, says, turn on the TV, I have, uh, we turn it on, we see the first plane hit, and then watch the second plane. Said to my friend, yo, I gotta get out of here, that's terrorism. So I went down, it's like the Lord just kept me out of downtown long enough so that I got there about 15 minutes after the collapse of the second tower. I went to my house, the Lord dropped in my heart, go get your collar. I never wore a collar in my life. And I would ride a motorcycle, and I have tattoos and earrings and banana, you know, so I'm not that kind of a... Not a collar guy. Collar guy, right. But uh, my friend, Pastor Mark, had said to me the year before, Rick, should always have a collar for emergencies. So I went, got on my bike. It was dead silence in the city. Got there, picked up my uh, collar, and got into Ground Zero. Um, and that began my uh, journey for the next year, year and a half. Pastor Schooling, why don't you tell us about your experience? Well, that morning I was sitting in my office. I always get to my office early. I was sitting in my office and doing work, and one of my secretaries came down and said, Pastor Paul, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. And she's kind of an excitable person, and I thought maybe it was some small aircraft or some accident that had taken place. And I said, well, keep me informed. And she came back down and she said, another plane has just hit the second World Trade Center. Well, now I really knew that something was serious, so I went outside, and where we're located on the southern end of the island, I could look back up and see uh, the skyline, and I, I saw the, the smoke and billowing out and the, the, the struggles that were there already going on. And immediately where we were, they uh, began locking down and locking down the city. They locked down the bridges. Uh, 
there, we, because we had a large parking lot, they started using our parking lot as a staging area on the island. And we knew that this was going to be a real problem. But we also knew that we wanted to be involved in what was going on. And, and like Ricky, I just, we decided immediately we needed to get a collar because I never wore a collar. But it, it was an opportunity to be able to get in. And we got certified. And, and we really got to know each other during that time, too, because we were going through a lot of the same certifications together. And uh, it was, began a journey that was an incredible journey to be able to help. And I don't know if you want me to go into anything else on. Hold that thought, and I'll, I'll, I'll grab both of you on that. I remember I was personally in my office at church, which we had recently bought the building, and I had a fancy office in the balcony. Uh, and uh, we were going to do a simulcast, and we had a TV on testing it. And I saw what looked like a replay of a plane hitting uh, the World Trade Center. It wasn't a replay. It was the second plane. And then my wife called, and my daughter was in her fourth day of high school. And on Staten Island, uh, Curtis High School, where she went, overlooks uh, the water, overlooks the beautiful, beautiful uh, skyline of New York. And uh, she had called my, my wife and said, uh, I think the World Trade Center is on fire. And my wife had told her, no, 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 honey, that's the sun or something, uh, thinking that, that that's, that's all it was. But that then began mm -hmm. our 9-11 our journey. I, I, I'm curious, uh, uh, Pastor Rick, what did you find when you got to Ground Zero? What, what was the state of things? So when I got onto my motorcycle, I had my collar now, went into the uh, FDR drive, police officer was there and he saw me coming in, he let me ride in. There were no vehicles moving in the city at all. Uh, there were no vehicles on the FDR and walking north were all these people full of ash. So I get down by the South Ferry, come out of the, that, that little uh, battery tunnel there and uh, as soon as I come out, I notice, yeah, I mean, I come out to all this ash. I park my motorcycle and the police officer says to me, Father, maybe you'd like to pray for these body parts. So there were body parts there, they were covered, and I knelt, I prayed, and, I, and when I got up, I looked north, and I noticed, you know, the, the big gap, the, 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 there was daylight coming through where the towers were. The bridge had landed on uh, one of the fire trucks, the sidewalk bridge, and, um, and that began uh, my journey uh, throughout the next, I mean, I was there till two o'clock in the morning, and I came back the next morning at 10. I parked my motorcycle this time up on West Street in Chambers, and the press came over, and uh, they saw me coming. I had my collar on, and they, they saw me coming, and they said, uh, Father, were you down there? And I said, yes. They started to talk to me about the election, and then um, I, they did this interview. That interview went around the world, but the local clergy saw it. And they began immediately calling Rick, what should we do? So we sent the word out, send everybody to get a collar, and we'll meet over at Pastor Mark's church. Uh, I think it was on Thursday. Um, and that began the, so on the 12th, we started the Ground Zero Clergy Task Force with my son and Pastor Mark. And then that became the Northeast Clergy Group, and God used us to help lead the clergy in the city because they didn't have access for right. the most part. They didn't have access, and we were able to get first responder uh, badges for, for all of them. Um, so that was my part. Wow. God had you there at a very, very special place uh, yeah. so that, that we, we could bring trained pastors, uh, pastors who love Jesus, to minister yes. uh, there at Ground Zero. Pastor Schooling, what was your experience with the, with the, the first responders? Um, you were there a few days afterwards, uh, but you were with a lot of first responders. What was it like with them? Where was their heart? What was up with them? Yeah, I had the opportunity of uh, very quickly getting certified to be able to go into, into the city and working uh, because we worked, first of all, the main driver for Mayor Giuliani uh, was connected into our church. And so we were able to 
find out how the best, what would be the best route to get all of our certifications so we could get in and work. But as I was working with the first responders, one, I'd been working at the um, family, life, family Assistance Center, and I was going back home. And so I was traveling back down to the south end of the island and needed, was going through, going to be going right through ground zero. When I got to that area, uh, there was a police officer there. And he immediately asked where I was going. I said I was trying to get back to Staten Island. And he said, well, I can take you there. And as we entered into that area, I asked him, first of all, as you're looking at ground zero at night, I, it, it, it was so devastating and it was eerie because everything was, was lit up and it was almost like a, a yellow orange look, was, it was glowing while they were working. But the, but the officer I was talking to, I said, how are you doing? And he said, I'm fine. And that's pretty much like every one of them would say when you first start talking to them that, yeah, well, I've got this taken care of, I'm tough. And we walked about three steps, and he said, well, I am struggling a little bit. And we walked a couple of more steps, and he stopped, and he turned around to me, and he said, I'm damn angry. And he had the tears. And it would be a five-minute walk or so through Ground Zero, and I ended up being there for six hours because he directed me to... Uh, other officers that were working with him and, and firemen that were working there. We, 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 we did debriefing through that whole area. Uh, he, they were sharing their struggles that was going on. And that, because I'd been working with for a long time, I'd been working with, with firemen and police officers and, and working in different rescue type situations. But never did I see the vulnerability and uh, that, that they had in, in that area of, of just talking about what was going on in their lives. And it was an opportunity to pray. They, they started bringing others to come over and saying, Father, he'll pray with you. He'll pray with you. And, 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 and they wanted to be prayed for. They yeah. wanted to have that security of knowing there was some semblance of sanity around them and that God for God was their sanity and they directed me even when we got into to working at St. John's that they wanted they, 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 they kept coming back and saying he's the guy you need to talk to because he can share with you and he'll be, he'll be honest with you as and, and, and help you out I, I was talking to a uh, a captain today who was six years on the job uh, uh, when uh, the towers were hit. And he talked about going into the pockets of the pile looking for people. And he said, in retrospect, he said, you know, 210-story buildings collapsing. He said, we were never going to find anything. But at that moment, you, you can't think that way. Uh, I think I'm going to start calling you fathered. Father Del Rio and Father uh, schooling them. Did, did you find a, a sense of desperation, yeah. Pastor right. Rick, at, w w with the firefighters? Yeah, so let me, um, yeah, it's funny, they wound up calling me Father Harley eventually. <laughs> um, but going back to 9-11 on that day, um, I, I go into, first of all, there's no police, no firemen. They had just, they were all, you know, they just perished. So as I'm walking on the, the, on the, you know, as I'm walking, you're walking over the fire apparatus and it's flat with holes and smoking. And I walk behind uh, the hotel there, uh, it was the Marriott, and some lady is calling out, somebody help me, my husband's on a wheelchair. So I walked over to where she was and I helped take him out to where they were evacuating people. Then I came back in and I went over to One Liberty and in front of uh, Liberty Plaza, right by Zuccotti Park, and the first uh, police officer says to me, Father, we need more like you. Thank you for being here. Folks, let me tell you, I built a church from the streets. 
telling people about Jesus. I'm an evangelist by call. And this is one time where I had nothing to say. It was silence. What, what do you tell somebody? What yeah. do you tell these guys? And it's the Lord just quickened to me there that day, the ministry of presence. I was the, locus, the, the, the closest link to God right there representing these folks, which really was the impetus for me to, to just call out to the clergy and, and deal with the mayor's office. They didn't want to give us, let me tell you another thing, they didn't want to give us permission to go into the in there because they considered all the churches like uh, you know divided up that we weren't a denomination so uh, they, we were just these little and we insisted and I said to them no those are our people in the ground those are our people taking them out of the ground we have to be there we want access and thank God we were then able to take the army of God into there and the Lord raised up that standard and the presence of the, the pastors uh, it meant so much to the firemen and to the police officers when they would talk to me to the families and by the way my role and I'll just say this that the Lord opened for me was I actually took Ann Graham Lotz down. I took all of the Billy Graham people in. We took uh, John Max, all, the, all these different ones. It was like I became the guy that was the usher. <laughs> and it was just that little part that God allowed me to, to play, to serve. And my heart was I wanted people to see what happened in our city so they could go back and pray. Yeah. Pastor Schooling, how much of what you did at Ground Zero was, like uh, Pastor Rick said, just listen to these guys. Were you spending a lot of your time just listening to these first responders? Well, you had to. Uh, that was where things were happening. We, and I agree with what Rick had said. Is it, it is that ministry of presence. It's just showing up and being there. And I knew that God had called me to be there for that time. Uh, I was re basically released by my church to be there uh, as long as needed, and I ended up being there for almost four and a half months, working uh, daily 12-hour shifts. And being, But yes, it's to be there and listen to what they had to say. It really helped me in everything that I was doing in my ministry because I realized even more that I didn't need to talk all that much. I needed to listen to what was being said to me and then be able to respond when they're asking that question. Just like it started with that first officer that first night at Ground Zero is that all I had to do was ask one question. Hmm. And then they began to pour out what was going on in their lives. And I found that day after day... And, you know, many times in counseling, by the end of my time of counseling in the church, I'm exhausted. Yeah. I worked all those times. I really didn't find myself tired because I just kept being pulled back in to be able to listen and be able to be that ministry of presence with them. And I'd do it again in a minute. It doesn't matter that I got cancer. I'd be do it again in a minute there to, to be there with them and be there for them because it's so important. And if we can learn one thing for us in ministry to others is, first of all, to be that ministry of presence, not to be the big wig, not to be the one that's in control, not to be the one that, that has all the answers, but allow God to work through us. And I thought about that just a second ago because I, I know you're looking to ask another question. Me? And as you're looking to, yeah, and as you're looking to ask, you're sitting there and you're formulating what you may need to say, but you didn't need to say it yet. You just needed to be there and be ready and then let it flow when it needs to go. You know, I think of uh, Job's friends. When they come to comfort Job, for seven days, they sit with him and say nothing. They didn't get in trouble till they opened their mouth. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, Rick, uh, this is a, maybe, maybe a difficult question, but this is a city you love. Uh, 
you like pastor schooling, like myself, of giving yourself to it. I'm sure there's plenty of times that you, you and, or I or pastor schooling go somewhere else, go to the, go to the Midwest. <laughs> Were you damn angry? Were you angry at 9-11? Um, no, I was very angry, but to be honest with you, um, I was, the mourning and the sadness, when I went into ground zero, you see the despair amongst those who are running into it when everybody else is leaving. I realized as I'm walking through at different points, I see the, the jet's wheel. And I'm thinking, you know what? These guys would be saving even the ones that did this. Yeah. If, if you know, they're not asking, are you black, are you white, are you this, are you that, are you Muslim, are you Jewish? Or, you know, they weren't asking those questions. They went to save lives. And I just think at that day, it just really neutralized everything for everybody that was there. So I, I felt, um, you know... So I didn't really have time to get angry. You, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I don't want to sound like uh, religious. I'm just telling you that the, the needs were so great that, the, the, that my way of doing the anger is to, to, to go in and do something about it. And that's really the, the role that I feel that God allowed us uh, to play. And let me just say this. Our, our church was located on uh, 3rd Avenue and uh, 7th Street. And the people walking north, okay, from, so you had the FDR drive them going, but then those who were walking north, including the police, be, our church became like an oasis and a stopover for them that day. All night long, they would come for water. They rinsed themselves off. And, uh, and then we became a hub where the ministries from around the country came. So we had about 2,000 that came through. Our, my wife, who's here, is, uh, she kind of ran all of that. Every day, every day, they came through. And we're just a little church. We were just a little church that just, you know, freely you have received, freely give. That's what we have done. And we thank God that we were able to be at the right place at the right time to be able to serve. Pastor Schooling, did you ever have a sense of anger, or did you channel most of your anger? Did you have times where you just you wanted to wanted to scream? I don't know that I had a sense of anger. I, I had a, there was such a strong sense of purpose and where I needed mm. to be and needed what things had to happen, and had a great heaviness of sorrow for what had been taking place, and for the those that were experiencing. Uh, as first responders, those that were, were coming through even later uh, to, to be able to help them out. And where I think that things kind of almost collapsed in was after the fact. When I was away in a different area, I know we decided that we were going to go out to the Midwest. And because I had been at Ground Zero, had been through the things that were taking place. They wanted to know what I had experienced. And then it became very hard for a while to talk about it. Hmm. I didn't want to talk about it. And as, as a matter of fact, for some of the things with, that we're talking about now, uh, I had let those things kind of go aside and go into other areas to work and not think about the ground zero activity, not think about the devastation that had taken place, not thinking about uh, the things that the people had gone through. And because the stories they told me and the struggles that they were going through weren't mine just to talk about. There were things that I would turn, not to turn around and boast about, they became a part of who I was now. And that forever changed me. I know I was surprised when uh, I began to talk about this with Chosen People Ministry on video. I was surprised at the emotion. Very surprised at the emotion. Um, Pastor Rick, are there, are there days where you still smell that smell? 
Oh, yeah, that smell will never go away, I guess. Very distinct. And um, when I, it was a, quite a while that I wasn't able to go back and watch a lot of this stuff. Because when I do watch it, you know, I mean, I'm there. I, I, it's PTS. I get emotional. I, I am an emotional kind of guy, by the way. Uh, and uh, so it meant a lot to us as a family as well. Um, my, my, my youngest son, his response, he wanted to do something. All, all my boys came into Ground Zero with me at one point, so now they're all on that being monitored. But my youngest son, he became a cop in response to that. So 19 years now, my oldest son had a, was in law. He left law, and he worked on the recovery of the city, and he never went back to law. My middle son became a teacher and youth director. But the thing is, all of these kids, you know what? It became a family thing. My wife made it possible for all of us to be involved. So it's very, very much alive. Wow. Yeah. I know my, the daughter I spoke of who called, uh, she actually wrote the, the, the article for Christianity Today for 9-11 about wow. ministering to the, to the first responders. Wow. Uh, that, that's a ministry that, that goes on. Uh, both of you uh, suffered from 9-11 cancer. Um, was there any anger from that pastor schooling? No, uh, there, there really wasn't. That, and that's why I said before that if, if uh, something like that it would to ever take place again and I had an opportunity, I would, I, I would respond in a heartbeat. I think your wife would break both of your legs, Pastor Schooling, and you would not go. <laughs> you know my wife, she might. <laughs> but in the depths of what I was going through with my struggle with cancer, because I had stage four cancer in, in, in two different locations, both diagnoses that, I lost the ability to walk. I lost the ability to eat. I was on a feeding tube for, for six months. I lost the ability to speak. And I remember during that time sitting in my home and the family was over for Thanksgiving and they, I would sit in a chair and look at what they were doing, but I, I, I couldn't respond to them. Couldn't eat. <laughs> and I couldn't eat. Smelled pretty good though. But what I remember most is many, many, many nights, because I didn't sleep much at all uh, going through the treatment, sitting in the dark and understanding, I think, better than I ever understood before what it means to silently sit and wait upon the Lord, silently sit and meditate on who he is, and cry out to him, because I was ready to go home, definitely ready to go home. And, and my doctors initially had said I had three to six months to live. So I was ready. But I remember saying over and over, God, if you're going to keep me, if you're going to keep me around, allow me to recover enough that I can minister to somebody else. I just want to be able to do that. I didn't know if I was going to walk. I didn't know if I was going to be able to, but that's, that's why I didn't want to have my tongue removed with the big tumor I had behind my tongue, as I wanted to be able to talk. And he allowed me to be able to do that and has kept me here. How about, how about you, Pastor? Hallelujah. Was there Hallelujah. angers, moments of anger? You know what, I, I think one of the things that has kept me going all my life is that um, I fell so in love with Jesus. That was my motivation. And to be able to be his hands extended and tell somebody, he gave me this understanding of the value of a soul, which is why we went to the police department, asked them for the worst spots in the Lower East Side. They said Clinton and Stanton. Avenue D and 3rd Street. That's where they kill people, sell their drugs, sell their bodies. That's where I took my wife and three sons, ages 3, 6, and 8, to that area. And for 10 years, we hit those streets and worked with those folks. So I never had a sense of fear. And I just am not a, an angry kind of guy. And I don't stay angry. God's allowed me to experience 
how to forgive and forget. I, I honestly do. And that, I believe, helped me throughout my journey here with this cancer. Um, I wasn't mad. You know, I'm glad they found it. Uh, they, I kept, if anything, I could have been upset with the doctors because I kept telling them for two doctors for four years, I kept saying, you know, I got this pain in my chest. They kept giving me nitroglycerin. They didn't think to send me to for, get an x-ray. Bottom line is, my new doctor, when I became 65, she sent, I tell her my story, immediately calls it a cardiologist. They check me out, says, get them up to NYU. They take me there. Within a couple of days, they find out I have stage four thyroid cancer. And then they did the biopsies, and they said it was very aggressive, stage four. So they took out three ribs. They took out part of my lung. They took out my thyroid. So now you have a little problem with saliva, right? We can't. That's why we, <laughs> we both have waters up here. But honestly, I'm so free. I'm not angry, and I'm not upset. And I just know that God has more for us to do. Amen. In, in our remaining moments, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Pastor Rick, and then you, Pastor Schooling. What's, what's the biggest lesson you think the Lord has taught you from 9-11? To engage with the community. So I'm looking at here at believers and whatever, whoever we're talking to online, I just want you to know, um, and this is what I was able to share with the pastors and leaders back then. We have to be engaged with our police department and our firemen. They need to know that they have people that love them, care for them, pray for them, support them. And the other thing was, whenever we needed something from the police, you know, you go to them. But let me tell you something. Those of you who are ministers, and this was a huge lesson, those of you who are ministers and pastors, become the people that the police go to because they know they can count on you. You become somebody that is available, and my biggest lesson is to be available and to remain available and always be a servant. Amen. Amen. Pastor Schooling? Boy, the biggest lesson, the, the biggest lesson for me was what I had shared earlier is, 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 is to show up, is to be able to be there for them and I've carried, I've tried to carry that on, and I, I know that even when I, I had shared my testimony of coming through cancer, uh, first time back where I was preaching and I, and it was being preached and, and, and recorded on the radio, and I had said that if anybody needs anybody to talk to about what they're going through, that I want you to know that, that, that I'd be available and I am available. And since then, I've had opportunities to uh, minister to those that are going through cancer, those that are going through uh, different struggles because they or, uh, or, or a loved one has been a first responder, and they, they, and they can't get through to them and can't get back to them because they've closed themselves off. But that very day... When I preached that message, uh, I had a response from a family in Belgium that uh, they had a daughter who was going through cancer, and they, as a family, didn't know how to really communicate with her because she seemed closed off when it, she, and we found out she really wasn't closed off, is that she just couldn't express what was going on in her life. And so I stayed ministering to them for several months uh, as the one who was going through the cancer and to the family were doing it long distance. And they didn't call it Zoom at that point. Something else. But it was, it was, but it was Skype. Skype. I think it was Skype that we're working with. But it was such an opportunity. But I, I challenge every one of us that... You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be even trained uh, uh, as a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a counselor. Quite often, all you need to have is a prayer relationship with God to where you're sitting and saying, Lord God, use me. Allow me to listen to what they're saying and then 
respond accordingly. Don't have to have all the answers, mm -hmm. but you might find that through those times that you have more answers than you ever thought you had because it's not coming from you anyway. It's coming from God. Allow God to use you. Allow God to lift you up. Allow God to, to, to bring you to where he wants you to be in that ministry of presence with those that you're talking to. It's an amazing thing. I, I, what you guys are saying it really resonates. You know, we are light and we are salt. But if we don't show up, the light doesn't show up. And we're not, you know, if, if we're not there, the earth doesn't get salted. So it's very, very important that we show up. In the neighborhood where I am privileged to pastor, before 9-11, we had a relationship with the firehouse. We had a relationship with the cops. We had a relationship with the local school. Um, we had a barely, but we had a relationship with the Little League. Uh, but at 9-11, I was able to walk down and with tears in my eyes say to Miss Apello, the vice principal, uh, our church building is open if you have kids whose mom and dads don't come home. And uh, we'll take care of them. We'll have people here. We're able to walk over to the firehouse, literally walk over to the firehouse. How is everybody? Is there anything you need? Uh, we actually became a hub for many of the, uh, the, the distributions that were, were needed in, uh, for the fire department, for people like that. But um, if you and I don't show up, light doesn't show up. Um, and you say, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not that good at this, or I'm not, as Pastor Schooling said, you know, God can use you. Uh, hey, uh, th this is, this is a, a conference from Chosen People Ministries. We're familiar with the Torah, Numbers, chapter 22, Balaam's ass. God can use, you know, a donkey. He can use uh, you and I. Um, the one thought that I had from 9-11, and I shared this with the people I pastored, was so overwhelming. It's almost hard to, 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 to relive the overwhelmingness of it. Um, but the one thought that I, I continually tried to share, and I don't know if I did it well, was that our God is big enough. Um, you know, this is, this is a huge city. And phew, pastors, how many broken hearts were in this city? And uh, since 9-11... You know, we lost uh, in, the, in the three events, 2,900 and I think 77. We lost 343 firefighters. And I remember when Mayor Giuliani said, this has been a huge loss for the department. I thought, oh, my goodness, we've lost 50 firefighters. No, we lost 343 firefighters. And since 9-11, we've lost 279 firefighters. That's the number today from 9-11 cancers. It's a huge Huge loss. But the enormity of it, we say, God, this is just too big. But it's not too big. God is big enough to put his arms around every single heart, every single person. And, and as we, we live this 20 years later, it is good for us to constantly remember that our God is big enough. How big is our God? Big enough. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for the amazing, amazing work that uh, these two pastors did. And Lord, I pray for your continued healing hand on Pastor DeRio and Pastor Schooling. I pray, Lord, that in each and every instance, Lord, you will give them amazingly good reports from their doctors. And more importantly, Lord, that you will always be their primary physician and that you will care for them and that you will give them strength and you will give them many, many, many more years of great ministry. We look forward, to, Lord, to the, the 30th anniversary of 9-11 and their testimonies. Use them and use them greatly. For us, Lord, your people, um, Lord, our, your people gathered online and uh, right here in this, your house. Help us, Lord, in, to be the people we're supposed to be. Help us to be light in darkness. Help us, Lord, to be the salt of the earth. And help our love for you, our love for Jesus Christ, to abound and to grow more and more and more and more. Thank you, Jesus, for the incredible opportunity 
of serving you. We love you today with all of our hearts. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys.